Welcome everyone to the Zorich Podcast. I am Chris Zorich, and on today's show we have a true Notre Dame legend. And I'm, unfortunately, I've said it before about other people, but this literally is the truth. Okay, we have two-time national champion, college football Hall of Famer, Outland Lombardi Maxwell. And what's unique about the Maxwell, for folks who might not know, the Maxwell Award goes to the person who's the best college football player that year. And by the way, defensive linemen do not win it. So just pause there. Yeah. Um, and this individual was the fifth in the Heisman voting in 1977, first-round draft pick, and had a 10-year NFL career. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Ross Browner. All right. Ross, thank you so much for being on my podcast. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. I, I really appreciate it. And hey, being the deepest of linemen, man, you know, we got to hang together all the time. Well, thank you very much. I do appreciate this. And I want to say selfishly, I, I'm interviewing you because I tried to follow in your footsteps and was not able to because I was not as, as tall as you were, but you accomplished so much. You're a four-year starter. Um, you really changed what uh, defensive linemen really were in college and also in the NFL. So thank you for everything that you've done. And thank you for being a trailblazer for me and my position at Notre Dame. Well, thank you, Chris. And uh, boy, I was so, so proud watching you play and, uh, you know, and making Notre Dame great like we always have and always making sure that, you know, we get out there and represent. And you represent very well. <laughs> thank you very much. So, you know, I'm, I'm really excited because Chris, having a chat. Yes, sir. You forgot UPI eight oh. lineman of the year. Like, there you go. Thank you. Hey, you, all right. Same line, and that was seventy six and seventy seven. There you go. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And I believe at one point you're on the cover of Sports Illustrated. Yes. And they also said that you were the most decorated college football player at that time. Yes. Yes. Now, we're talking about Heisman Trophy winners. We're talking about everybody else. But when you look at all the accolades you had and everything you accomplished during your time, you surpassed, like, literally running backs and quarterbacks and everybody else. Well, hey, I was always after him. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you were. Literally, you were You were definitely always after him. Hey, Chris, I, I caught up with him, sacked him, and, uh, you know, took him down, everything. You know, take the ball from him. Yeah, give me that ball. I mean, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and, and for folks who might not have had a chance to watch Ross at one point, please go back. He's on YouTube. Um, what he's done, again, I mean, he really changed what it was to be a, a defensive lineman. And for you to, to be at Notre Dame is, is really interesting because even when you look at the, the defensive lineman who were inducted into the College Football Hall of Fame, there's only three. I'm talking to one. Yeah. I'm the other one. And Alan Page is the other one. So there's only three. Hey, Notre Dame. Notre Dame. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you have had just such an interesting, interesting life. Um, I want to, I'm going to go way, way back to talk about the fact that you were one of eight kids. Uh, yes. And this is – Amazing, but you had um, six brothers. No, you yeah, you had six brothers and sisters. I'm yeah. sorry, you had six brothers. Six brothers, two sisters. Uh huh. Okay, and six, four of the six played in the NFL. Yes. Yes. Okay, that's. I mean, what what was in it? It was was it in the water in Warren, Ohio, or I mean, what happened? Well, uh, yeah, we hey, we went for well water. Well water. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me find some of that well water. <laughs> hey, all kind of minerals and nutritions. <laughs> but I mean, you know, it was it was like this, Chris. Um, you know, our, our mother and father was always into education. Okay, very true believers in that because you know my father, like a lot of fathers, probably in those days uh, in the forties and fifties and all that. Uh, he was born back in forty, well, about like forty one or nineteen forty. Okay, and, you know. He was uh, in a family of 11, and he only, you know, he was like the youngest uh, son out of 11. Wow. And, you know, he, um, he had to quit school in order to help the family 
Mm. So, you know, make money back then. And so he did everything from, you know, from picking cotton all the way up. So, you know, he, you know, he really helped out the family. And then uh, he met my mom and moved to Warren, Ohio. And okay. he was from Sasser, Georgia, down there in that area. And, uh, you know, he, he got up there and they, he started on a sanitation truck. Then he got in the steel mill. And boy, I tell you what, Rob, you know, we, we never, never missed a mill. <laughs> okay, well, which is kind of strange because you're talking about a household of 10 people. Yes. And, and I'm assuming when around dinner time, it was tough when were you guys fighting there. I mean, well, what was it like during dinner time? Uh, uh, shifts. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Well, we ate shifts sometimes because everybody was involved with some kind of sport or some kind of activity. Wow. Okay. Uh, even the girls, you know, they were okay. cheerleaders and, you know, and g- gymnastics and all that type of thing. And uh, we were in all the sports, so we played everything. And uh, just to stay off the streets and not get in trouble. That's mm. what my mom's main thing was, you know, she signed us up into the YMCA. And, really? And uh, one of her employers uh, was uh, Cop- Copperwell's uh, president and CEO. Okay. Uh, he got us. He said, how many boys you got, Jerry? I said, he said, well, she said well, I got six. He said, well, how many are above 10? I said, well, he said, well about, I got about, about three or four. He said, well, I'm going to put them in the YMCA for you. I said, okay, cool. And that's where I got all, you know, all my talent and, and leadership. And I, I was a swimmer. I, I started off as a swimmer. Really? Yeah, I, I swam all the strokes and I was a diver. Okay, so so I mean, how was how was it growing up in Warren? High? I mean, was it um, talk about during the fifties and sixties, right? Uh, yes. Uh-huh. So was it an all black area? Was it segregated? Was I mean, was it all white? I mean, what was the area like? Oh, we were very diverse. We were very diverse. Really? Uh, we had Greeks, we had Italians, we had Polish, we had blacks, we had uh puerto ricans mexican we, you know we had a whole mix of mixture uh so you know i grew up with everybody oh and, that's terrific and uh in public school you know we we all went to school together and mm. you know, one thing about warren uh they gave us the best teachers and the best facilities and the best uh fields and courts and everything that for us to play and to be able to develop our bodies and our minds that's amazing. I mean, especially during that time to be kind of that melting pot. So, so what's like the history of Warren? I mean, was it uh, a, a a blue collar town? I mean, what was the industry like? Uh, blue collar, mm-hmm. uh, uh, steel mill, uh, okay. uh, General Electric engines for uh, airplanes. Oh wow! Okay. You know, we had uh, copper well that did a lot of you know copper and everything tubing and all that type of thing. And they uh, sent it all around the world. Um, and then also, you know, water, we were known for water fountains also. Yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah. So we were, we were very blue collared there. And, I see. You know, we uh, just believed in everybody and everybody believed in each other. And, you know, we had, we had no, I mean, you know, no problems, you know, other than ah. the high school or, or the, Elementary, you know, type of type of deals where you know you always have a bully out there somewhere. Sure, sure. And, well, well, here's the thing that I learned about you. Um, apparently, you. to to combat the bullies, you took up boxing. Yes, yes. Uh huh. I, I had this one foe. <laughs> I should say foe. Uh, <laughs> no, I won't bring up his name, but you know, he was one of the guys who's just bullying everybody on the uh, on the playground, and okay. you know. You know, you get on the playground fifth and sixth grade, you know, you don't want to be bullied. Uh, you know, so we we were, you know, I, I had my father buy me some combat boots. Remember those back in the oh, yeah. okay. Army, Army combat boots? Because, you know, you fight with your hands and your feet. <laughs> wow. And, you know, on, on the uh, playground. So, you know, it, it was like, you know, uh, he challenged me and, you know, hey, things have to happen and, you know, we got paddled for it in school. You know, back then they paddled you. Okay. Ooh, boy, oh, man. You're talking about those principles. Oh, my goodness. Oh, uh, well, you get about four or five swacks. Oh, my gosh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> for this deed, uh, for this uh, uh, mis- misconduct. And uh, they sent us back to class. So, you know, we, we had a very well controlled and very 
uh, well managed uh, city of Warren. So mm. we we didn't have uh, we had crime, but you know crime was uh, out in Youngstown and other areas. You know, okay. But you know Warren was very well controlled. So what was the population of Warren? Uh, Sixty six thousand. Oh wow! Okay, all right. So, so did a lot of kids outside of the Browners? Did a lot of kids go to college in the uh, area? Or? Yes. Uh, matter of fact, we have about like forty-seven pros out wow. of our out of our city, and uh, Paul Warfield is our number one. That's amazing. Yeah, Paul Warfield, wide receiver for the Cleveland Browns and the Miami Dolphins. Uh, you know he. Uh, he still goes back to Warren now, and they have a statue and everything in front of his uh, wow. high school. Yeah. Wow, yeah. that's amazing. That's yeah. an, Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about kind of um, what was the household like? And, and I, I only say that because, I mean, this is a unique situation. I mean, there were four of you guys played in the NFL. Okay, that does not happen. And – I was doing a little bit more research and found out later on that in 1987, your mom was made, uh, she won the, the, the NFL Mother of the Year Award. Yes, yes, yes. See, they honored her uh, NFLPA, and I I'm still have her, her trophy in my, uh, you know, my, my man cave here. Oh, and, that's great. And, uh, you know, it was just a great affair, you know, going in Hollywood, uh, bringing mom out there and all the, all the brothers that were in the NFL. And, uh, you know, we just had a wonderful time with her. And her favorite stars back then was Jimmy Stewart. Wow. Uh, let me see. Who else? Uh, 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 Cheryl, Cheryl Ladd. Um, wow. You know, so they had about like five or six of her favorite stars. Oh, really? Wow. And, yes. Yes. And, oh, that must have been great for her. Uh, it was tremendous for her and for us. Yes. <laughs> okay, so so now I mean, are you guys lifting weights? Are you guys like rumbling around in the basement? I mean, how does how does a household now? Just to let folks know, you got a better chance of like winning the lottery than becoming an NFL player. I mean, it, it's it's that rare. Yeah, and you have four under one household. I mean, yeah. like I said before, was it in the water? I mean, were you guys lifting weights in the basement? Like, how did that happen? Well, you know, we all played together, you know, all the kids in the, in the neighborhood. And, uh, you know, we had a lot of, we, we played all the sports. So okay. with dad and mom, we, we built our house on uh, uh, 1621 6th Street uh, in Warren, Ohio. And okay, we're, first of all, how do you remember that? <laughs> You're impressed. It's, it's already pressed in there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm impressed. And, uh, you know, so we, uh, mom, mom and dad, we rebuilt our house. Uh, we bought a like a little lot, and then we had a lot on the corner that was okay. There. So dad went on ahead and bought that one. Okay. And we kept it mowed and kept it clean. So we played all the sports. All, wow. All the sports right there on that on that lot. And um, you know, so you know, we go all the way down to almost like dark playing football, baseball. A basketball, uh, you know, badminton, anything, any game you can think of, we played. <laughs> so was it like the whole neighborhood just said, hey, go over to Browners? Or, okay. Yeah, it was like a neighborhood gathering, yes. Wow, yeah. that must have been great. And then uh, we started, started. Uh, I, st I started lifting weights in about eighth grade. And oh, okay. I went, I went up to the high school, we had all the equipment, uh, Warren Western Reserve, so the um, – the head coach at that time told us that we could work out in the evenings after after class. Okay, we finished, so we would walk over to the high school, and uh, about about eight of us, uh, all you know, from eighth grade, all of us went over to lift weights and start building our bodies. So you know, back then, you know, you're trying to impress the young ladies, so you know, you gotta gotta get some muscle. You know, gotta gotta look. Oh, you're right. You're right. <laughs> so, well, but that's just so interesting because, I mean, did – okay, and, and, and I want to kind of state something else. You had two brothers that followed you to Notre Dame. Yes. Which was um, Willard and – Jimmy. Jimmy, okay. Uh -huh. So that they followed you to Notre Dame. And then you had two other brothers that went to USC. Yep, exactly. Joey and Keith. <laughs> All right, okay. All right, I'm, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here, but I'm just so impressed by that. All right, so – brother uh gerald you went to the university of georgia oh really 
Yeah, he went, he went Southern on us. <laughs> well, but it was still a Division One scholarship. So I, I don't I mean, were you, were you was your family able to afford college? I mean, you talk about six kids. So no. this was literally the, the only way you guys were getting to college. Exactly. That was the only way is, uh, you know, get scholarships. So, you know, we're so fortunate that we're, you know, able to be recruited. Um, and I was the first one recruited. So we right. had like, I had like over 30 something schools that were uh, looking at me. So it really brought a lot of attention to our program. Okay. And, you know, and I was a uh, Northeastern lineman of the year. And then I was a soup, you know, you had the back then you had the super 11 Sunkiss Super 11 okay. of the nation. And I was one of those. Wow. So, you know, it, it really brought a lot of attention to us. You know, USC, uh, Nebraska, Michigan, uh, Iowa, uh, Notre Dame, of course, Mid um, you know, Penn State, Pittsburgh. I, I mean, I had so many different colleges and being from a country town and, and not been anywhere. Other sure. Than other than Detroit to visit my relatives up there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I said, well, put me on a plane. I'll be more than happy. I've never been on a plane. And it was back then it was prop plane. So oh my you know, gosh. as you're flying, you know, you get in that air pocket and it, and, oh. it, and it falls. Did your heart just come out of your mouth? I, I left my stomach up there. I said, <laughs> <laughs> and the, and the, um, the flight attendant right over to you said, are you all right, Mr. I said, uh, yes, this is my first flight, but, uh, you know, I'm trying to get used to it. She said, oh, well, that's, oh it's just natural. It's nor, uh, don't worry about it. You'll be okay in a few. I said, all right, well, thank you so much. And after that, I was on planes going everywhere. <laughs> wow. So do, do you remember what, what other schools you visited or? Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, Kansas, Kansas University. Uh, okay. Uh, Kansas State. Uh, uh, now, now, were these official visits or uh, official visits? Okay. All no, right. We, we had no limit. We had no limit. Oh, but, oh, you didn't have. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah. So you were you were just rolling, huh? I was going everywhere. <laughs> Kent State. I mean, I mean, that was right down the street from me. But Kent State, um, Ball State. I mean, I was going everywhere. I because I, I didn't know, you know, what school was going to land and you know, grades and, you know, ACT, SAT was very sure. important back then. So I had not uh, taken them, but I was set up to take them. But, you okay. know, at least you were able to still take those visits and, right. uh, and see, you know, but, but I came out very well. I came out very well with all that. And my grade point average was about 3.3. 3. Wow. Uh, so, you know, I, I really was uh, okay. You know, I was like, okay to go and, you know, and I had so many uh, Notre Dame, uh, Ohio State. I mean, Ohio State definitely was after me because being a Ohio State boy, sure, uh, man. You know, you you say uh, Woody Hayes was at the house about six times. So you wow. know, you so know. how was it for your parents? I mean, were were were, were the coaches? I mean, were Listen. your parents excited to to see him? Did they cook him dinner? Like, I mean, how did it work? I mean, I, I'm, I'd love to hear about that. Oh, it was tremendous. Uh, they would call her and talk to mom and dad. Okay. And, uh, you know, they were very thrilled and very excited. They said, well, you know, this coach, I talked to this coach and, you know, I talked to that coach. I said, okay, wow. well, great. I said, I was so impressed that, you know, they were so involved. They were very involved. And they told me one thing, Chris, was you decide on which school you would like to attend. Wow. Yeah, no input. They just, really? It's up to you. It's up to you. So they left it up to me. Okay. And so, of course, the next question is, <laughs> how did you choose Notre Dame? Well, um, it was very, very uh, – I ran from Notre Dame at first. Mm. <laughs> you know, they, they came to my school twice. Okay. And, and back then, they were all male. And right. I said, I am not going to know all male school. <laughs> I, I'm from the public system. I, I believe in women being in the classroom. I'm there sorry. you go. Yeah, I, you know, I can't learn that way. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then uh, Coach Yanto and uh, Greg Blosh and Mike Stock, uh, they, they were after me and at that time. And they were on the staff and everything. And, and Joe Yanto was my defensive line coach all four years. And uh, so he, he, so Joe came to the school and uh, 
my uh, school secretary, who was Martha Wilson at that time, who knew me very well. She, you know, she was part of the family with mom. Okay. And, but she helped out with a lot of paperwork for us. You know, okay. Mom was uh, in tune, but you know, it was so much paperwork that you have to do. And uh, Marty sure. Wilson helped her out a whole lot with that paperwork. So, you know, it was like, okay, Ross, we are now admitting females. I said, okay, well, cool. That is so cool. I said, hey, uh, well, I, I'd like to take a visit now. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I took the visit uh, and, uh, Oh man, I tell you, when you meet Air Force Legion, it was it was just phenomenal. I I just I just had a, we clicked, you know, we really wow. clicked. and um, he became my godfather, you know, almost like mm. my father there. And uh, my father loved him, uh, my mother loved him, and of course, you know, I had uh, Nebraska, Michigan, you know, shoot, uh, Oshemaker, uh, you know, uh, Nebraska had a new new coach just coming in. And uh, Osborne, uh, wow. Michigan State had uh, Duffy. I mean, um, let me see who else. Uh, Penn State had uh, Joe Paterno. So that was like all the legends. I yeah. mean, how do you wow? How do you choose? Oh, it, it was tough. It was tough. But you know, I, I had to go with my heart. I had to go with my heart. And mm -hmm. you know, I, I said, well, Notre Dame. You know, I went to all the other schools. Some of the schools had professors in the classroom. And some of the schools did not. They had props, you know, okay. or, or prom, prompts, you know, like. Right, you know, teleprompters. Yeah, teleprompters and everything in the classroom. And I said, wait a minute, you got 200 students in here and you got a teleprompter in front of them. wonder if I have a question. I have, you know, I sit in the front of the class. Okay. I, I, I have a question all the time. Uh, excuse me, I didn't understand. Could you repeat that again, please? <laughs> you know, I'm one of those kind of guys. If I miss it, I want to get it. So, you know, uh, and at Notre Dame, uh, they only had like, um, I think my biggest class was biology, and it was 200. But we had, a, but they had a prof out in front of you. Wow. And always instructing. So, you know, that, that really intrigued me. And then plus being father- Joyce and Father Hesburgh and oh my goodness, uh, oh man, all all the greats, you know, uh, uh, Ed Krauss, I mean, mm -hmm. Moose, Moose Krauss, okay. right, and um, Colonel Stevens, uh, met met so many wonderful people there at Notre Dame, and uh, a lot of fathers, a lot of a lot of uh, sisters, and they talked to me, and I told them, I said, well, you know, religion, religion is very strong in our family. Because we, we, you know, we grew up as Baptists. Okay. And, uh, you know, so I said religion and education and knowing their percentage of graduation was uh, 90, 98 percent back then. And uh, a lot of the schools I was looking at was like 58, 59. Uh, some were in the 40s. And I said, mm. oh. I said, no, 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 no. I, I, education is more important right now. And uh, so that's how I picked Notre Dame. That's amazing. Okay, so before you went to Notre Dame, yes. you had a run-in with Paul Brown as a senior right. in an all-star game. Yes. Can can you share with us a little bit about that? Because this is kind of a unique story. And when you fast forward a couple of years, you know, something else happens. But talk to us about how uh, you talked to Paul Brown in an all-star game. Oh yeah, well Paul, Paul, you know he, he's he's the master in the football. And, and I'm sorry for those of you who might not know who Paul Brown is, uh, he was actually the coach of the Browns and also the Bengals. And uh, yes, and he's from Ohio, right? And he's from uh, Maslin, Ohio. They okay, like, uh, 14 state championships at Maslin when he was there. Wow, so, he was a legend. He was wow. definitely a legend. And um, at, at at after the game, you know, All Star game and everything, we you know the North against the South. Uh, well, of course, the North one, but you know, <laughs> that's where I'm from, the North. And, um, you know, he walked up to me. He said, hey, young man, what's your name? I said, well, Ross Browner. He said, what school are you going to? I said, well, I'm going to Notre Dame. He said, all right, I'll keep my eyes on you. I'm going to watch you. I, I kind of like your play. He said, I like how you play out there. I said, well, thank you very much, sir. I appreciate that. And uh, that's all we said. <laughs> and he, wow. had, he said, I'm, I'm watch you all through college. And uh, when I was drafted with him and he brought me into his office, he said, Ross, you know, I've been watching you since uh, 12th grade. No and, way. Uh, he said, and, uh, you know, 
when your name came up, you know, I thought he thought it was going to be gone by second or fourth. Okay. You know, Kansas City has uh, was going after a defensive end, and I think New York or uh, Philadelphia was going after defense, a uh, defensive lineman. Okay. And so I went eighth pick. And he said, I was so happy that you were still around. And he said, I, he says, there's no way I was going to pass you up because I wanted you on my team because I didn't want to play against you. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. <laughs> but I just think that's amazing how, I mean, you know, he, he kind of kept, I mean, obviously you're a great player, but for him to understand and see talent at such a young age in your case, right? And yes. just say, you know, hey, and he may have gone up to a couple other people in the room, who knows? But the idea that he was able to kind of keep in, well, not keep in touch, but kind of keep his eye out yeah. on you. Yes. And then literally four years later, he drafts you. So that's, I think that's an amazing story. And, and then to end up still in Ohio. So that was wonderful. Cincinnati, Ohio. So amazing. You know, it was uh, tremendous. And, you know, I just said it was a great honor. Great honor to play for it. That is great. Well, I'm not going to skip your, your Notre Dame career because that's kind of why we're here. But oh. So talk to me about coming on campus as a freshman and playing. Because at that point, um, there was a rule before that freshmen could not play, correct? Correct. Uh-huh. And it happened only because, you know, the Marshall airplane crash. Oh, uh, right, right. Uh, 1972. Okay. Where- where they lost the whole team and coaches and everyone. Right. So they only had freshmen. You know, freshmen was uh, playing wow. freshmen. So they only had freshmen left. So the NCAA had to make a rule and say freshmen were allowed to play uh, now as varsity. Wow. So that happened in 70, the late 72. And every okay. day, I think Archie Griffin took advantage of that at Ohio State. Right. And <laughs> Uh, I was at his game when he when he made his first start and everything. I said, who's that 45 down there? I wow. said, oh, Archie Griffin. He ran for 234 yards and two touchdowns. I said, and he and he's a rookie. I said, boy, I said, why? I'm a freshman. Uh, but I said, it's tremendous. And uh, and then of course, you know, Woody Hayes said, Well, you know, I play freshman. I play freshman. Wow. <laughs> but um, yeah, that's 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 where it started. And uh, when we got to campus, you know, we we were, you know, we we were like the, uh, the freshman team. Okay. And, you know, we had like uh, about, oh, I think we had in our class maybe about thirty, maybe, maybe about thirty all together, but probably about ten to 12, 12, 12, 12 blacks. Okay. Oh wow. Yeah. Okay. So we had twelve, and um, so you know they played us against the varsity, and. Air threw all this his, his stuff at us, right? You know, and, and we had Wayne the Train, we had uh, Eric Pennick, you had uh, you know Tom Clements, you had uh, Dave Casper, Steve Sylvester. I mean, all these guys, you know, they were coming at us. I mean, they, but we we stopped them, and uh, they couldn't move wow. all on us. And Air said, "What is going on over here?" <laughs> wow. Uh, what he called uh, after the game and everything, watching the, uh, the, I guess the practice film and everything, he brought uh, a couple of us, about nine of us, to his office, and um, and uh, Luther and I, you know, uh, he said, well, my my interview uh, went very well, and Eric said, well, Ross, you know, I was looking at you for a tight end. I said, well, coach, I, I like scoring touchdowns and you know blocking and all that type of thing, you know, but. My thing is destroying offenses. I, I like getting in the backfield, sacking and throwing, <laughs> throwing running backs and everything around. And so I like and everything. He said, well, you can play defensive end. I said, well, thank you so much, sir. I appreciate it. <laughs> so that, that's that's the way I got to be on defense. And because uh, he was looking at me as a tight end on offense. And that year, I think uh, Dave Casper mm-hmm. just changed over from uh, offensive tackle to you know, tight end and became okay. a great, outstanding tight end. Right, and, and he's in the College Football Hall of Fame yes. as a tight end. So yes, <laughs> exactly. So uh, you know, I, I I was just so happy just to play. You know, and to be able to start as a freshman. I mean, that was just tremendous uh, to me. 
Uh, and and my, I hate to fast forward, but you guys won a national championship your freshman year. Uh, yes, and I scored the first two points that year with a black kick against Northwestern wow. in their first game. Yeah. Okay. Uh, see, I'm, I'm I'm learning more, and that wasn't even in my research. I'm sorry about that. That's that's, right. that's impressive. <laughs> and uh, I said uh, a black uh, I blocked the uh, the punter. On uh, Northwestern, I blocked his uh, kick and it went out the end, back in the end zone, and scored the first two points for us in 1973. Yeah. And now, and that, era at the, but era used to coach at Northwestern, right? Yes. Yes. So I'm sure that that, that game meant a lot to him. Oh, it always. Every time we played against Northwestern, it was always exciting for him. <laughs> wow. So, so how was he as a coach? For you, and you mentioned before, he's kind of like a godfather to you. I mean, yeah. I, I didn't have a chance to play for him, but I heard amazing, amazing stories about him. I tell you what, uh, Chris, he was tremendous, uh, brilliant mind, brilliant mind, and and, and uh, not just only with football, but with how to handle young men, mm. and how to deal with uh, situations and everything, and um, you know, with. Uh, with Era, you know, he, whatever comes out of his mouth is truth, you know. And if he says, you know, it's not raining today and it's raining, it's not raining. <laughs> <laughs> you know, wow. and, um, you know, and uh, just, just to, you know, be underneath his uh, coaching, coaching ability and everything. I tell you a funny story. I was in practice, you know, and, you know, they had a tower, you know, where Era would be on the tire to make sure all the design and plays are going sure. correctly. And you remember the play where they had to throw back to the quarterback, right? Okay. Uh-huh. So, you know, every day would be like a sweep going away from you. And then the quarterback would sneak back around and then try to go up and try to, you know, get behind everybody. So it was, uh, right. It's the halfback could stop and throw the ball. And, um, uh, and so I was over there playing around, you know, I said, okay, I'm going I'm, to I'm, I'm see if I can intercept the ball. I'm going to show coach I can intercept that ball, you know. So I, I was over there lagging, you know, I'm playing like I didn't sing, you know. Right. <laughs> he said, oh, hold it, hold it. <laughs> Brian, what you doing? I said, well, coach, I'm baiting him. <laughs> he said, wow. hey, he said, Brian, we don't need you baiting them. Just, just cover him, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I fell out laughing. I said, boy, coach is watching. I better do everything right from that point on. Wow. <laughs> wow. So that was a funny thing because he watched everything on offense mm. and defense. So, you know, tremendous coach, wonderful coach, and that's a brilliant man, brilliant. Wow. Now, now you also mentioned Coach Yanto. Yes. And – he actually retired after my freshman year. So oh. he was still at Notre Dame coaching defensive line yeah. in 1987, yes. which is amazing. And, and he was our defensive coordinator also. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so defensive line, you know, he never gave that up. <laughs> wow. and, uh, he was, and then here's the unique thing about Coach Yanto. He was like four foot five or something like that. And he he's had – I mean, obviously, you you were a lot taller than him. I was more his size, but but I mean, you know, he, he, it's kind of funny because you had this very short man in in size, yet he coached giants. Yes, yes, Walt Butowski, uh, mm -hmm. uh Mike 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 McCoy. All all these are six 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 five, and, he, and you know what he would do? He said, "Take a knee, take a knee. <laughs> let, me, let me talk to you for a minute." <laughs> They could be. Because <laughs> <laughs> they wait. <laughs> wow. Like, oh, take a knee. I need to talk to you for a minute. Let me, let me explain your your position here. You know, mm -hmm. and, and he would go through it and everything, make it so plain and so simple. And, you know, and you go through all your uh, techniques and everything. And he would critique you on a lot of different things. You know, you can get through there quicker, Ross, if you're ripping through instead of trying to swim. And uh, so he taught us a lot of great things in order to make us uh, great defense alignment. And, mm. and that penetration, uh, that's what it was all about, getting in that backfield. 
I right. wanted to get, get beyond the line of scrimmage. I want to be on their side of the scrimmage line. Yeah. I love that. Wow. <laughs> Um, so you obviously had an amazing career and I'm going to talk a little bit about that some more, but talk to me about how it was for you socially on campus being in Notre Dame. You mentioned before you came from a diverse town. Right. And so I'm assuming when you got there, it wasn't as diverse as your hometown was. (laughs) It was not. And, uh, even though uh, we had a lot of students from around the world, which I really enjoyed, um, you know, seeing all the different cultures and I uh, really learned a lot just by being on campus because, you know, you know, Chris, when we first got there in 73, you know, they used to call us jocks. Like, like, you know, all the other schools that I went to, oh, that's the jocks dorm over there. You know, uh, I didn't want to be a jock. I, you know, I said, that's a, that's a piece of equipment that I wear. Okay. Mm. I am a student athlete. Mm. So, by by half of that year of 73, we had our students calling us student athletes because wow. I said I had to be I, I'm a student first. I got to get the grades in order for me to be able to play on that field out there for you. I got to get the grades in the classroom. So I'm a student and then I'm an athlete. So call me a student athlete, please. You know, and from that point on, we had no no trouble, no, no problems. And everybody just you know, fell in line and just said, uh, hey, those are student athletes. They, they didn't call us jocks. So that's you know, so that, interesting. Yeah. So that was really good there. And um, we didn't have too many, but that's where Eric Parsegian came into play. OK. He gave us um, black families in this in the in the South Bend community. Really? So we got a chance to get off campus wow. and still associate. And one of my biggest families was uh Captain Paul Harvey and his, wow. he, was, he was captain of the police force yes, yeah. and uh, his family would do barbecues for us every Saturday and we would go over and just enjoy and he have all his neighbors and friends. And so we, we built a great uh, community aspect mm. by doing that with uh, coach, uh, well, Captain Paul Harvey and Sharon Harvey. Okay. And uh, we had a couple other families, uh, the Smothers, Ed Smothers and, and Marla, uh, they, they were another another good family that we would visit. So we had families in town that Air Force Season connected us up with. Sure. But we wouldn't get homesick, okay. which, which um, would ha- it happened to a couple of our players. They left and, uh, you know, felt homesick. So, you know, went back home. Sure. And um, unfortunately, you know, I, w- I wish they had a better experience for them because they were great athletes and, and good students also. But they just couldn't take the, uh, I guess, the sociability and things that were available uh, at that time for us. So we we, we created uh, the student black black student union. Okay. And uh, we would have parties there and play, you know, blackjack and you know cards and spades and tra- you know <laughs> everything you could think of. Uh, all the games. Uh, I, I like playing chess, uh, and that was my thing. And uh, you know, so we, 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 we got along very well, you know, so we, we built our own society. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. You're listening to the Zorch podcast with our guest, Ross Brown. If you'd like to watch this interview or our other interviews, please check out my YouTube page at Chris Zorch 50 and click subscribe. Uh, so this is kind of interesting. Um, I've only had a chance to win one and that was hard. But you had a chance to win two, and I'm talking about national championships. So you win one your freshman year. So let's yeah. fast forward a couple of years. It's your senior year. Yes. And I want to talk about the last game of the year playing against Earl Campbell. But if you have a, a good story that kind of talks about maybe a game or two in between that, I'll be more than happy to hear that. Okay. Okay. Well, um, <clears throat> Before we got to that, though, Chris, um, you know, my I lost my father my sophomore year. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, my God. And, I'm sorry um, about that. And that's when uh, Coach Dan Devine uh, took over for, you know, Coach Eric Parsegian because he retired in 74. Okay. Um, at the 74 season. 75, uh, Coach Dan Devine took over the team, and everybody was in a little bit controversy about him taking over the team. And I said, well, they asked me, I said, well, 
you know, this is a pro coach. I said, hey, this this gives me a chance to look at the next level of how coaching will be. So I looked at it as a positive. Okay. Very positive. And um, and just followed him. And boy, Coach Devine, I said, well, you know, and he had about seven of his uh, coaches that played in the NFL. You know, um, you know, we had some really good guys and, you know, they were very good coaches and everything. And, you know, Francis Pay, I, I just, oh, gosh, uh, Johnny Rollins. Um, wow. So so just, just as a side note. Oh, yeah. I was recruited by Francis Pay All when right. he was at Northwestern. Yeah. And Johnny Rowland was a running back coach when I was with the Bears. So that's that's oh, crazy. So cool. <laughs> wow. Both great guys. Both great guys. guys. And uh, they were on uh, Coach Devine's staff. Okay. And uh, so, you know, we, we had some uh, other great connections. And, you know, Coach Blosh always had us over, too, to his house with his wow. family. And uh, so, you know, building up from that, you know, that's when I think my playing ability changed. Really? Yeah. My, my whole attitude and everything, my junior and senior year was, uh, you know, I was asked by my father to take care of the family. And uh, on his dying, last dying breath, uh, just take care of the family, Ross. Mm. And, you know, and I, that's, I, I told him I would. I shook his hand and gave him a kiss. Mm. And, uh, from that point on, I, I became, I guess, into manhood mm. <laughs> uh, to, the, to the next level. I was ready to uh, really uh, take off from school and, uh, you know, work so I can really money for the, the kids and everybody back at home. But my mom, my mom did not hear of that. She said, wow. I'll work 10 jobs before you leave that field. And, and Dude, leave- I got the chills. That's amazing. <laughs> and uh, so she, she said, go back. You, you know, you're going back and you're going to do a great job and you're going to lead us. And, you know, don't worry about a thing. I'll, I'll take care of everything at home. You know, you mm. just do everything that you have to do at school. So that made me feel very proud that she, you know, she took that confidence in me. And uh, from that point on, you know, uh, everything changed. That's when accolades and different awards start coming my way and sure, sure. uh, our team's way. Uh, and then also, I mean, also part of your family kind of came with you, right? Because you had two of your brothers come to the other day. Yeah. Uh, Jim is 75. He was a running back. He's okay. running back. And, um, and then uh, Buller came in in 76, and he was a running back. And both of them, uh, you know, of course, you know, it's too many people in the running backs area. <laughs> you know, we had Jerome Heavens. Also. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That, um, you know, so we had some great running backs back in there. So Jim said, well, maybe I want to play defense. So Coach Yanto, of course, smiled. <laughs> you know, he said. Wow. Hey, I got two, two Browners. <laughs> I got two Browners on defense. Wow. So he made him strong safety which was very good. And uh, we used to have uh, plays that Coach Yanto came up with us, uh, with, for us. Uh, it was called Thunder and Lightning. Oh, and, my gosh. Uh, was Lightning and I was Thunder. Wow. And, uh, you know, so we, we would, we, you know, he just walk up to the line and say Thunder. You know, that meant I would go first and he'd cover for me behind mm. me. Or else he'd say Lightning. And that means he goes first and I'll cover him from behind. Wow. So, you know, we, we, we threw a lot of, a lot of offenses off that way. So, ah, yeah. and well, and then at the end of the day, it's not only are you playing the the game that you love, but you're playing it with your brother. I mean, but, how many people yes. have a chance to say that? I, 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 don't, I, I don't know how many, but, you know, I was very proud to have, uh, you know, two brothers that played along with me in 76. Uh-huh. Mm. Yeah. So that was mm. tremendous. And, um, uh, you know, Willard really did real well as a running back and all. And uh, then after that, you know, he wanted to change schools. Uh, you know, he wanted to go to uh, Tulane University. I think okay. that's Greg Blosh had just got promoted down there for defensive coordinator. Okay. Uh, so he said, I'm going to follow Greg Blosh and go down to Tulane. He said, okay. I said, well, all right. Well, he made that decision. And uh, so he was just left with uh, Jimmy and me. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. And, um, and then in, uh, in that game, I tell you what, uh, you know, in Texas, Cotton Bowl, you know, nine and one, ten and zero, oh, Texas, great, you know, they won. Earl Campbell, 
Earl Campbell, we heard all that. Earl's going to run all over you. Uh, you don't have a chance. I don't know why you Catholics even showed up. Uh, you know, we're just great. Don't you know we're playing in Texas? We're the biggest thing. <laughs> we heard that for a whole week. Wow. You know, you know, going to ceremonies and things like that. You know, we were up in the balcony, and they were all always on the main floor. And giving really? out. Yeah, and giving out the uh, watches. You know, they gave their the Texas team their watches first, and we received ours second. Really? And we're sitting up there saying, "Wait a minute, are we playing the same game?" I said, "Are we?" <sighs> you know, they have not beaten us yet. They act like they have beaten us. You know, mm, and, mm, and, mm. Uh, a lot of us, you know, uh, players. You know, we just we knew we knew the difference, and we said, "Hey, they they have not played us yet. Do they know that we?" Are you know we we don't play that way you know we don't play that and like homie don't play that but right right but you know it's um one of those type of things where we just said that we're just gonna you know uh coach the uh Yanto when we were talking about defensive strategy we knew that Earl was going to be the runner so our strategy was if somebody hit him hold him up. And there's mm -hmm. other people hit him so we can tire him out. And that's what happened. You know, when he got hit, he got hit by, you know, sometimes four or five people, you know. Wow. <laughs> and then we take him down. But, you know, at least, you know, we, we wore him down because they, we knew that was the whole offense right there. And when they came out uh, and tried that, you know, of course, the uh, Oklahoma shuffle, I call it. <laughs> where, right. You know, yeah, the triple option. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so, you know, I play, I played it like, you know, anything else. I played the dive and Ken Dyke was inside. So I knew Ken would tear him up, you know, if he's coming in inside of me. And um, so I, I, I watched, I watched him with the, with the dive and then the quarterback had the ball still. So I said, well, if I challenge him, he'll try to pitch it earlier. So we have a better chance to get Earl deeper into the backfield. Wow. So during that that episode, you know, I was able to get my hand and knock the ball free. And, mm. and then I was able to recover the fumble. And from that point on, it was like, score, Joe Montana. Wow. So, you know, we made the first three points, and we didn't look back ever since. You know, we beat them 34 to 10. Oh, yeah. That was amazing. Earl Campbell had 100 and uh, – 10 yards, no touchdowns, um, and, uh, you know, he left the game with a sprained ankle. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting. Unfortunately, he wound up winning the Heisman that year, and you came right. in fifth. Yes, yes. And, and at it, that point, at that it, time, they didn't have you guys all go down, right? Right, right. Um, yes, they did. They had oh, they did? Oh, okay. Yeah, we went to New York. I, I won um, – Defensive lineman from them. I, I got a crystal, beautiful crystal ball. Okay. Trophy for being defensive lineman of the year. Okay. Uh, and the Heisman. And they gave out a couple of different awards. Okay. It was a big uh, thing on ABC, CBS, and all that. Wow. So it was a big, big, a big show. And Earl won, which was uh, very good because, you know, he, he was a tremendous player. Tremendous. Okay. Absolutely. I'm not taking anything away from that. I'm just amazed that kind of the, the team that beat him – had a representative in the yeah. Heisman building, you know? Yeah. And, uh, you know, I was, I was, uh, well, you know, the Outland, uh, they, they said I was two inches too wide from the defensive tackle. So they had to outlaw me for being up for the Outland that year. And they gave it to Brad. What? Uh, Brad. <laughs> yeah. They gave it to Brad on uh, the defensive uh, tackle for, uh, for the uh, Texans. So they You're had. you kidding me. Outland Trophy winner and the Heisman Trophy winner. Wow! And, uh, I'll tell you what, with Ernie Ernie Hughes and you know uh, Steve Daniel the Daniels, uh, I mean they they wore him out. He didn't, he did not do anything that game. Okay, mm -hmm. and, uh, I just laughed because I said, hey, you know it's the Outland Trophy winner. Y'all go out. He said, we'll watch us, Ross. We, we'll show you how we're gonna handle him. <laughs> I said, wow. Okay. Wow. So they did a great job on him too, Chris. So, I got one more story about Notre Dame, and and that's you, did did you you participate in the Bengal bouts, right? Oh, yes, yes, that was part of my training. 
Okay, so how so how was that? I mean, I'm assuming you're 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 a heavyweight, right? Uh yes. Heavyweight. Okay. My All right. Jim was the light lightweight with uh, Doug Becker, and I was against uh, Ken McAfee. and uh, we had a couple other uh, football players. We had about eight of us. Okay. We went into uh, boxing training. You know, it's really you know, off season '76. You know, we felt like we just wanted to get in a little better shape and sure. faster hands, quick feet. You know. You know, as boxers are, you know, we got, I, you know, I had the style of Muhammad Ali. So, you know, I, that was my, that was my uh, great, uh, tremendous great that I always watched because, you know, feet and hands is always my thing oh. being quick with. And I, I see your boxing, uh, boxing trophy back there. Actually, this is, uh, first of all, I wish I boxed, but I, 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 I'm, I, I'm not that talented at all. Actually, this is a war from Muhammad Ali, though. Oh. Um, I was fortunate enough to do a lot of uh, charity work when I was with the Bears. Yes. And um, I was very fortunate enough to receive the Muhammad Ali Humanitarian Award. Wonderful. And Chris. we actually had an event, and, and he presented it with me with the trophy. So that's a, a huge, huge honor. And then over, I don't know if you can see, but over to my other side, let me see if this looks familiar to you. Oh, I got one of those. Oh, oh, oh. How'd that happen? I don't even know. Whoa. Now, mind you, and I'm laughing. So for, for those, that's a Lombardi award. Yes. But I'm laughing because this is like maybe one hundredth of the awards that Ross got. So I think that's that's so funny that I'm sitting here bragging about my stuff to a guy who accomplished like 500 times more than I did when I was in college. So no, 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 Chris, you did a wonderful job. I mean, Hey, they, they, they uh, you know, when you go through uh, all of the things that we had to go through and if they, you know, you've been in our shoes and had to go through everything that the challenges that we had, uh, you know, you just tried to excel and you excelled and you showed Chicago that you were the man. And I, I, that's, I, right. that's, that's one beautiful thing that I love about you is, uh, that you you went out and really showed who you are, and well, thank you. You are a champion, and that's thank that's, you very much. I appreciate that. that. And coming from you, that means a lot because you're one of my idols. So I well, do thank you. That, uh, Muhammad Ali, uh, you know that I, 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 uh, my wife was with the Ebony Fashion Show. Okay, we were down in Atlanta, Georgia, and we called it, um, you know, the um, Trumpet Awards. Okay, every year, and of course, my wife. Uh, was uh, there, uh, I guess she was making up Muhammad Ali and uh, for the show and everything. And she said, I had a chance to meet him. And he said, oh, you're a boxer, Ross? And I said, yeah, yeah, I, 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 you know, champ, I, I kind of use your style, you know, if you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> he said, oh, okay, show me, show me something. I said, so he threw his hands up, I threw my hands up. Oh my gosh. Well, hey, yeah. He said, "Okay, you got, it. you got." It. <laughs> wow, you sparring with Ali? That's awesome! Wow, yeah. that's great. So he, um, you know, every time he said, he, he would always say, you, "You got your left up?" I said, "Oh yeah, I got my left up." <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, it's kind of interesting because I, I like to kind of make this the segue into kind of boxing in the NFL. Oh. Okay. And I, I didn't know this existed. Of course, I came a couple years after you did, but apparently there was the NFL Boxing Championship. Please explain that. Well, what the heck was that? I tell you what, um, you know, uh, one of the uh, studios came up with this idea of having offense and defensive linemen boxing. And wow. it took us down to Pompano Beach, Florida, which was beautiful, a beautiful resort down there. And uh, Jerry Lewis, Elizabeth Taylor, all those kind of actresses and, mm. and actors. Always were there, and along with uh, a lot, you know, a lot of the, the rich and elite, of course, because it's a spa, it's a whole spa, and uh, beautiful spa down there in Pompano Beach, and uh, you know, so they invited us all down, and uh, we had matches. We had, I had five matches. Everybody had, you know, for the championship and everything. So and, were you guys down there for like a week or something, or the kind of round robin? Okay. Yeah, we were down there for a week. Okay. Uh, you know, so they round robin was exactly how you know you got to pull the hat and okay. you know whoever you're going to go against, they would ever put them up and you know that's that's who you would box against. So I had uh, Bruce Davis. Uh, let me see, Bruce was with the Oakland Raiders. 
Daryl Goldford with Green Bay. And well, what, I can't imagine the teams, the they, owners were excited about this. Well, they really weren't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're like, wait a minute, wait a minute, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> I got my I got my first rounders out there boxing each other. No way. Yeah, and I, I ended up fighting uh, Jackie Slater for the championship. Oh wow! Okay, for the championship. Okay, for the championship. And uh, you know, so Jackie was knocking people out the ring, and uh, <laughs> and you know, and I said, oh my god, I, I'm not knocking anybody out the ring, but you know, I'm winning the, the matches and everything, right? And, and you know, we oh man, the hot and cool. I mean, the sauna. I mean. Excellent, excellent treatment. I mean, mm. total treatment. You know, you got everything that the spa offered. You mm. know, facials. I mean, I, I, you know, I just did it all just because. But <laughs> why not? Uh, but enjoyed that experience. And uh, the winner of the the boxing match, uh, we uh, it was twenty five thousand, and just to participate was seventy five hundred. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So uh, you know, we uh, we went through it all and. Uh, I won the best boxing match, and I was supposed to get a stereo system, but hey, send me that stereo system. I'm still looking for it. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I did get the money, so I, I did leave that. And wow. After the Bengals found out about it, Paul Brown and, and the Bengals called me up and said, Ross, I hear you were in a boxing tournament. I said, oh, yeah, coach, uh, you know, just doing some, you know, extra extra training, extra work. Right. Said, well, uh, I'm glad. I'm glad you didn't get hurt, but – um, you know, you, you can't do that anymore. I said, Oh, why, why coach? He said, well, you know, um, you know, it's in the contract that, you know, you're nothing dangerous like skiing or, oh, you know, okay. or motorbikes and all that type of thing. You, you're not allowed to participate or, or get on those because you might harm yourself and boxing we consider as a harm. So, wow. <laughs> and I, and I was just, you know, um, uh, too Tall Jones was fighting back then. Oh, my God. Yeah, Too Tall was fighting, and he was fighting professionally. So they were trying to set up a match with us in New Orleans against uh, the NFL boxing champ and, you know, Too Tall Jones. So I, I was looking forward to it because, you know, they were talking about some big money there. I, said, <laughs> I think I can do something like that for three rounds. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> but, but they had to call it off because, you know, uh, the Bengals, they, they fined me uh, $500 for Ouch. And I said, well, you know, I said, hey, I, I just had a wonderful and great time with that. So when you were growing up in the area, was it, um, I mean, Paul Brown was with both teams. Yes. In Ohio. So did you have a favorite team growing up or? Uh, Cleveland Browns. Okay. So. Yeah. That's the closest team to us. And okay. We're like 50 miles away. Oh, perfect. Okay, so, so now, so you have a chance, maybe not to play for your favorite team, but you're playing in the same state that you grew up in. How was that experience? Tremendous, tremendous. I, I didn't have to leave uh, my state of Ohio. And, uh, you know, they, they showed me all the glory and, the, and, uh, and, and you know, fans. Uh, fans just are tremendous. I, I got them all around the world now since I, you know, participated in the Super Bowl. And, uh, you know, it's just wonderful to be able to play for your state that you grew up in. Sure. It's just like you in Illinois, you know, in Chicago. You Very know, lucky. Playing with the Bears, the Bears. <laughs> Very uh, lucky. It's a, it's a tremendous uh, feeling and, and effect. And plus, you know, one thing I always wanted uh, when I was playing, Chris, I wanted my family to see me play. And, mm. you know, uh, that's, that's why I chose Notre Dame also, because – they showed broadcasts on Sundays, Sunday morning. Oh, right, right, right. Okay. Lou Nelson. Every I said that's how that's how I knew about Notre Dame and Tom Gatewood and you know uh, you know I, I tell you what it is just wonderful and, and Alan Page, uh, you know uh, Judge Alan Page now, but uh, Judge, right, exactly. Um, and then you know and hearing about uh, Heisman for the Heisman, all that type of thing. So. Mm. So it was just uh, wonderful to be able to watch that. And I said, I would like for my family to be able to watch me uh, play in college. So I, I didn't care if I was on the suicide squad, like the kickoff team or whatever. Sure, sure. I was going to tackle somebody. <laughs> Dude, why not? Why not? Okay, so so now the is the USFL 
around when no, they weren't around when you got drafted, right? Uh, 85. Okay. 85. So in 85, you actually make a jump. Can you kind of talk a little bit about that? Because I, I thought it was really interesting. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, in 85, I was uh, contract negotiations with the Bengals. Okay. And uh, I wasn't uh, getting the, the price that I really wanted. Uh, so I had to, uh, I said, well, you know, I can go over to USFL and, you know, play for a team, uh, you know, uh, you know, what do you think? Because I was uh, negotiating uh, my contract and, you know, my uh, agent at that time was uh, uh, Jack Childer. So, you know, he, uh, he, he had a real good connection with Houston gamblers. Okay. And uh, the dentist down there uh, was uh, very interested in me playing because they had just lost their defensive end for the year. And he said, well, you know, we'd love to get Ross. Is he available? I said, well, let me check with, you know, Cincinnati and see what they say. You know, uh, I always check with them. And, uh, wow. said, well, you know, uh, you know, we're not ready to negotiate that part of it yet. Ross, I said, well, okay, well, I'll just go and play in the USFL. So I jumped <laughs> for three months. <laughs> for three months? Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. So, and then I got back and they said, we thought you were joking. I said, no, I told you I had a chance. They said, well, wow. well, well what numbers are we talking about? <laughs> so wow. I was able to get the, the numbers that I wanted at that time. Okay, wait a minute. But but now, but that was in the NFL's offseason, obviously. Yes. Right? So, yeah. so you played for three months there and then didn't training camp start for you guys? Like In July, yes. I, I finished with them in June. You had 31 days. Yeah, uh, March, April, and May. In oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So, okay, right, right, right. Okay, all right. So you had three months to get ready after playing three months of contact, real hard football. I mean, real football. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was there with uh, Jim Kelly. I mean, you know, we had some, we had the quarterback, man. We had a, you know, we had a team. We had a fast team. Wow. We were called the Houston Gamblers. That's and, amazing. Tremendous team. I really enjoyed it. And I, and I, I wore number 79 there. And uh, there you go. So, yeah. <laughs> so I was able to keep a number and uh, and just had a great, glorious time with uh, playing down there. Uh -huh. So one of the highlights you did have was playing in Super Bowl 16. Yes. yes. And although you didn't win, yeah. Y'all almost won, though. Well, almost, uh, but, you know, we, we had too many turnovers, Chris. Uh, the first half, we had four turnovers. Oh. And, uh, they stopped us two times at the goal line. Mm. And uh, so, you know, we didn't get any points out of all of that. And so, you know, you can't you can't win a game if you can't put anything on, on the scoreboard. Sure, sure. We, we talk about turnovers. I mean, it's, it's, it's rough. But yeah. there's this iconic photo of you and Joe Montana after the game. Yes, yes. Um, looks, I mean, you, you guys were teammates, which is great. Um, and and it just just that, that – that, and I wish I had the technology to put the, the photo up on the screen, but I don't. I'm sorry about that. Okay. Um, but, I mean, I look at that photo, and I don't see race. Um, I yep. see two, two teammates. Two brothers, yeah. Two and, brothers. And, and, and guys who had fought with each other – in college, yeah, and then against each other, you know, in the pros, right, and now just kind of saying, you know, hey guy, you know, good game, good game. I think that was that was great. I tell you what, I I, I still have that on my wall up here in mm. my man cave, of course. And Joe Montana is still my brother to this day. You know, uh, we call each other brothers because you know we we go through a lot of things. Uh, Joe was uh, on on a practice squad. Uh, my, my my sophomore or his sophomore year. Really, Joe Montana. Yeah, Joe was on practice squad. Wow. He had uh, injured his uh, arm, so okay, rehabilitating. So you know he was uh, the quarterback for our scout team, and uh, I taught Joe how to duck. He was ducking all. Uh, you know, <laughs> oh, don't don't run that way. Run that way, so they can be a you know a different target for you. You know. <laughs> and wow. He, and he and he mastered that, but. I'm the only one probably in all Joe's uh, four Super Bowls that had a sack on him. I, I was going to say that because you wound up getting you wound up getting him, right? Yeah, I got him one time, and uh, and you know that was uh, one of those uh, lucky lucky 
I, I call it a lucky move <laughs> <laughs> that I did on that day. And, uh, you know, and then when we met at the 50 yard line after the game, I said, great game, Joe. I said, I couldn't lose to anybody else but you. I said, I feel good. I said, you played a great game. And we were one, and they said I had a possibility of being MVP. So, you know, wow. that, that, that was that close the, uh, you know, the ballot thing would have been. But, you know, it was just one of those type of games where, you know, it was just an honor to play a, uh, a game like that and be watched around the world. Mm. And, you know, cameras, I mean, uh, flashes, uh, people hollering, screaming, uh, big, big audience. Um, you know, stadium and everything. And, you know, we just, we just really uh, performed and did it. I thought we did a pretty good job of playing that game. We came back from 20 to nothing to 21 to 26. So, you know, they only got three field goals on us in the wow. second. Goal. So, you know, we, we're, if we had played like that the whole game, we, you know, we probably had a possibility to win. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, no kidding. So, I mean, you know, it, it, obviously football has, has done – amazing things for you um, and obviously <laughs> your family, brothers and sisters. Yeah. Um, and you have a son that yeah. played in the NFL as well. Oh, yeah. That, I mean, again, is it the water, the genes? I mean, please, you know, I mean. <laughs> well, this time I have to say it's the genes. <laughs> <laughs> so your son, now he had a chance to win a couple of Super Bowls, right? With two, the Steelers. Two Super Bowls and uh, one loss. Wow. And Max Starks, number 78, uh, left offensive tackle. And uh, he was 6'8", 345 pounds, and he played for 10 years with the Pittsburgh Steelers. That had to be an amazing feeling just to know that not only me and my – did my brothers have a chance to play. Yes. But understanding kind of what this game means to your family. I mean, yeah. What does the game of football mean to you? Uh, well, it meant it meant a whole lot um, because you know it brought the revenue that really kept my whole family going. Mm. And um, you know, since my father told me those words of uh, take care of the family, I took it very seriously. And um, so, you know, I just wanted to make sure that our family grew up right. And you know, and Max coming in was uh, from a University of Florida, uh, Gator. Right, <laughs> you know, he he visited Notre Dame, but you know, being a Florida boy, a uh, guy coming from Florida, yeah, it was too cold for him. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, he said he had to make another decision on that one. And then my my son Ryland, he went to the University of Arizona, and he graduated. Uh, but you know, he was a defensive lineman, and you know, uh, at that time, I think he had a coach, uh, Mike Mike, uh, for I can't remember his name right now, but you know, his um. Uh, brother was an Oklahoma coach. Okay. And, uh, you know, he was uh, not letting him play defense. He wanted him to play offense. And Riley okay. like offense. So, you know, he was 6'6", about 280. And uh, he said, I'm a defensive tackle, defensive end. I, you know, that that's that's my blood, <laughs> you know. But he wouldn't let him play that position. So we understand, you know, uh, how people have to make decisions. And my son just said, oh, I'll just decide just to graduate. I said, okay, that's fine. And, wow. and then we had uh, my brother, uh, Keith, had Keith Jr. And Keith Jr. played with the Texans <laughs> for three years. Yeah. yeah. This is amazing. <laughs> yeah, Keith Jr. played with the Texans for three years behind, uh, you know, the big man there, of course, you know. And, uh, you know, it was just one of those uh, type of things where, you know, I, I was really, we've all been very fortunate that football was our avenue. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That is amazing. Um, we talked about Notre Dame on the athletic side. Do you have a memorable moment kind of that was maybe a non-athletic moment that you remember when you were at Notre Dame that kind of meant something to you? Uh, yes, when I made the uh, honor roll. <laughs> really? Really? at Notre Dame and I was like all oh, right I told you I can go against the world with my education <laughs> wow know? and just to do that Chris I thought that was a tremendous uh, trophy in itself and I, I was just so honored to be on the honor roll at Notre Dame and 
you know, I, I, I only made it one time, but that was a good, that was good enough. Okay. That's great. That is great. And, and, and also, man, I like to ask guys this because you kind of mentioned before, I mean, you had your challenges, uh, kind of walk in there a little naive. Um, what would uh, you now, uh, what would you tell a young 18-year-old Ross Browner walking into Notre Dame? I would tell him, go in with his eyes open, uh, his heart open, and uh, religion, believe in God and the uh, Lord Jesus Christ, and uh, just follow your dreams and make it happen. Uh, you know, whatever you want to make happen can happen. And just uh, be serious about what you want to happen and make it accomplishment and uh, and just achieve everything that you want to achieve for your family and yourself. Wow. That's cool. Now, you've been around some great leaders, Paul Brown era. Um, what did, Were there any things that you took from their leadership style that helped you along the way? And, and really kind of what's your... Uh, take on leadership? Um, when you looked up as uh, being a leader, you have to be um, a good example. A good okay. example. Um, you have to have uh, faith. You have to have honor. You have to have courage, uh, respect. Uh, and really, uh, you know, just understand and have knowledge of what you're talking about and where and who you're talking to so that they can understand where you're coming from as a person. And once you're able to be able to do that and explain yourself uh, clearly to them, um, you know, anything can be accomplished. Uh, you know, you can get a lot of goals set, uh, and get a lot of goals accomplished, and uh, you praise God. You praise God and tell him, thank you, Lord. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Mm -hmm. and, um, and you know, just just keep praying. And uh, the prayer, prayer helps a uh, whole yes, lot. Yes, it does. I Absolutely. Mean, I Absolutely. Had, I had some chess, Chris. I, I mean, you know, I was in <laughs> and, and, and psych. And oh. God, just get me through this chess. I don't know. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, I'm I've definitely been there. I was down at the grotto. I was at um, you know at the library. Uh, wow. The library in front of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I, we got a test tomorrow. <laughs> oh my gosh! But, wow. but you know what? It worked. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So actually, 2021 marks the 75th year of the Black Student Athlete at the University of Notre Dame, and that was Rachel Thompson. Yes. Um, what does kind of when you look back on? your experience and those you've seen of other players, um, what does 75 years of the black student athlete at Notre Dame mean to you? Oh, tremendous honor. I mean, tremendous honor. Um, you know, from all the sacrifice, uh, from all the desire and where, do, where everybody's uh, background has come from. And, you know, just, just to make um, a university like Notre Dame, great uh, to make sure that you know we did all the right things you know we had to be a student athlete and we had to follow our dreams and follow our hopes and our prayers and you know and, and make our families uh, proud of us and our school and our you know state and nation and everything um, but you know it's just one of those type of things of where you know um, you just have to really have uh, I, I, I guess uh, a good good idea of what you would like to see happen and with mm -hmm. our 75 years at notre dame i would like to see us have some kind of uh, tribute uh that shows all the athletes in all the sports and mm -hmm. be able to go into it like uh yeah uh, like a, a mirage you know you go in there and you put your uh you go in there and pick out a player or pick out a sport and sure. you walk in front of a a different trophy or whatever, and all of a sudden it tells you all the history, and wow. then this area and tells you all the history of this, and you know, you, and you know, just go around and be able to envision being on the fifty-yard line in a, in a packed stadium with Notre Dame fans hollering and screaming. I think that's the most ex wonderful experience anyone could ever experience. Uh, 
you know, it's, it's a thrill. It's, it's almost like, wow, you know, uh, this is what this is what it's all about. Mm, 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 mm. I love that. Well, I want to give a shout out to Tom Gatewood because he was the first black captain. I yes. know you were a captain. Yes. I was fortunate enough to be a captain as well. So, you know, you look at what kind of Tom paved the way for us, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, there were some challenges that he had to face. And because of individuals like himself, yeah. we've been able to succeed. So um, I was fortunate enough to have Tom on the show a couple weeks ago. Yeah. And he, he really talked about some really great stories that he had as well. Well, I tell you what, Tom Gatewood has been part of my life when I first got to visit Notre Dame, and he wrote me a letter. Uh, he was working uh, and playing with the Giants at that time, and wrote me a letter and told me all the uh, fascinating things and advantages of going to Notre Dame. Wow, I didn't know that. He didn't tell me about that. Yeah, he wrote me a, a letter, and I, I think my mom kept it. I probably have it somewhere in, in my archives, somewhere, <laughs> you know. But uh, Tom, Tom... Uh, Wrote me the letter, and I said, "Oh, hey, you know, there's an athlete that you know felt to reach back and let mm. go, but always be challenging, and what's in front of me, and what could happen on the other turn." He says, "Once you graduate, you know, after you played, you know, you still be able to go out into the world and make a make something of yourself." As mm. Well. Mm. He was a businessman at that wow. time. Right, right, right. Uh -huh. so, That's a great story. So uh, Tom Gatewood has been. Uh, uh, a uh, great, great honor and great, uh, great star in my eyes. Because I used to watch him, number 44, wide receiver. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, I said, throw it the time. <laughs> you know, yeah, watching Sunday mornings, throw it the time. Okay, we got a touchdown. There you go. Wow. Yeah. Watch wow. Notre Dame highlights. Yeah. Oh, Ross, this was awesome. This is, this is great because, again, selfishly, I've had a chance to interview one of my idols because – I tried to do what you accomplished at Notre Dame. I did a little bit of what you and you, you did a lot of it. So that that's that's very very impressive. So I just well, want to say thank you very much, Ross. You you got you got a national championship, Chris. Hey. Yeah, yeah. I, I have one. You have a couple. You know. So, <laughs> but hey, that that is the most greatest victory of all. You know, knowing that you uh, got awarded the highest honor in football and. Uh, you know, that, that's tremendous. And you got some wonderful honors and, and coming. And, and, you know, I know your mother's so proud, very <laughs> proud. And I know my mother and my father are so proud of me. And, and the family is still going. So I'm, I'm just been blessed. I've been totally blessed. That is absolutely wonderful. Ross, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. All and right. I'd like to thank everyone watching on Facebook and YouTube. And most of all, the wonderful team of my wife and daughter, Kylie and Candy. They kind of helped me produce the show. Without them, I would not be able to do this, believe me. Um, this podcast, along with our other ones, you can check out on YouTube at youtube.com backslash chrisresorts50. Uh, please press the subscribe button. Uh, Ross, this has been awesome, man. This is, this is great, and I, I look forward to hopefully having a chance to, to do this again. Oh, we, we will. We will. Uh, Chris, you know, we got to, you know, we, we're going to be in this a long time. You know, we're going to be around and uh, go Irish. <laughs> I love it. Go Irish, Ross. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All right. God bless.